Hi there. My name's Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And today I would like to talk about emitter followers. So I'm going to draw a bipolar junction transistor in its NPN form. And up here, I'll draw VCC, the upper rail power supply. And over here, we'll have VN, so that's going to be my input voltage. Over here, we'll measure V out and output voltage. And you're probably used to seeing a resistor here, but today I'm not going to do that because I want to talk about emitter followers with active loads. So we'll put down a, another NPN transistor going to ground. And this is all kind of without loss of generality. If you have a different voltage down here, you could basically just shift all the voltages up or down. All right. So here I'm going to place a voltage. I'm going to call it V1. And this is going to be a constant voltage that sets a bias current. So I'm going to assume that the output here is feeding some ideal input that has infinite input impedance. Similarly, I'm assuming that Vn and V1 are being produced by ideal voltage sources that have zero output impedance. We can go back and talk about input and output impedances of this particular circuit in order to do a more detailed analysis in a bigger circuit. Because we're assuming that no current is flowing through the V-out terminal, we can say that the current flowing out of the emitter of transistor 2, oh, I should number these transistors, shouldn't I? So we'll say that this is Q2 and this is Q1. So this IE2 needs to be equal to the current flowing down here through the collector of transistor 1. So I'll call that IC1. So this is IC1. Now we know that if we have IC2, we could divide it by the parameter alpha 2 in order to get the emitter current. So what model do I want to use for our collector currents? To talk about that, let me draw an isolated NPN transistor down here, and we'll label this as VC, and we'll label the voltage at the base VB, and we'll label the voltage at the emitter VE. So here, the collector current IC will say is capital IS, a reverse saturation current times the exponent, the exponential function of VBE over UT. UT is usually taken to be 25 or 26 millivolts at room temperature, but it is a function of temperature. Something that will come into play later is this IS is also highly dependent on temperature. So I'm using UT instead of the usual VT because later when we look at MOSFETs, we have a VT0 representing threshold current sometimes. So using U here instead of V helps us avoid getting confused in that MOSFET scenario. And I've just gotten into the habit of using it, so I also use it for BJTs. Now, technically, there's also a minus one in here, but everyone generally ignores it because if you have enough VBE to have this exponential term matter, it swamps that minus one. One other thing I want to talk about is the early effect. So this isn't an ideal source. So I'll write 1 plus the voltage between the collector and the emitter times the early voltage VA. Now one thing I want to emphasize is this is assuming that this transistor is acting in the active region. The corresponding region for MOSFETs is called the saturation region, which is really confusing because for BJTs, that saturation region is something else. And the thing that we call saturated in BJTs is actually called ohmic or triode for MOSFETs, and it's all kinds of confusing. Anyway, I generally tend not to use the term saturated when talking about BJTs. I prefer to say the ohmic region just to avoid that confusion. Anyway, there's a little trick I want to do here. Let me take this and rewrite it. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an approximation that's going to come in handy later. So you might recall from your calculus that e to the x is well approximated as 1 plus x for small x. And we often use this kind of approximation on this term here in order to linearize it and use our linear circuit theory. Here, I actually want to keep everything exponential, and I'll show you that does some really neat stuff. So here, I'm going to use this just going the other direction. So instead of linearizing the exponential, I'm going to exponentialize this linear term. How crazy is that? Anyway, I'll say that this is exp vce over va. Now, there's one more thing I want to do here. Let's make a little change of notation. It's perfectly innocent. There's nothing to be worried about. And say that sigma is equal to ut over va. So if I do that, I can rewrite this as is exp, whole bunch of stuff over ut, and I'll write vbe plus sigma times VCE. So if I plug my sigma into here, the UTs cancel, and I wind up with the 1 over VA that I want. This is a kind of expression that also comes in handy when dealing with subthreshold MOSFETs, but we'll talk about that another time. So on the left here, I'll write IS2 over alpha 2, Notice that right now I'm assuming that the transistors may not be matched. Later we'll see what happens if we can assume the transistors are matched. Let's see, I have EXP. Voltage at the base is going to be VN minus the voltage at the emitter is V out. And this is all over UT. And let's see, I also need to have this term here. So I'll have sigma 1 VCC minus V out. So that's the collector voltage minus the emitter voltage, which is V out. I think I need to move this over this way to leave some space for the next thing. Eek. All right, I didn't plan this out well. Anyway, on the right-hand side, I'm going to have IS1 EXP, and then I'll have V1, sorry, that's chopped off on the edge here, minus ground, plus sigma 2 V out, which is the collector current minus ground. Can I squeeze that in here? Oh, this looks really terrible. Sorry about that. Anyway, this is all over UT. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the logarithm of both sides since I have an exponential on each side. So I'll write minus log alpha 2, and I'm writing minus because it's in the denominator. But after taking the log, I'm also going to multiply everything through by ut to get rid of it. So let me put a ut here in front. And let's see, I'll also have a plus ut log is2 all over is1. So I'll assume that before I took the log, I divided by is1. And then I have this vn minus v out plus, oh wait, this shouldn't be sigma 1. This should be sigma 2. And this one over here, this should be sigma 1. If I was a more dedicated YouTube educator, I would go back and redo it starting from here, but I don't feel that dedicated. After all, how much are you paying for this? All right, so I have sigma 2 VCC minus V out, and then on the right, I'll have V1 plus sigma 1 V out. So now what I want to do is I want to get all of the terms associated with Vn together and all the terms associated with V out together. So on the left, let me write Vn and then all the constants. So I'll take this V1 and move it over to the left. So I'll have V1 
and then I'll have minus ut log alpha 2 plus ut log is2 over is1, and then I have the plus sigma 2 vcc, and on the right, I'll have v out, because I have a minus sign here that turns into a plus when I move it over here. And let me write it like this. I'll write V out times one, that gives me this term here. And then I have a sigma one over on the right already, and then I'll have a sigma two on the right. So I could say that V out is equal to all this junk, V in minus V one minus UT log alpha two plus UT log IS two over IS one plus sigma two VCC. And this is all over one plus sigma one plus sigma two. Okay, so that looks like a handful, but most of this is not actually that important. These looks like sixes. Let me make sure these are more like sigmas. All right. So quite often, sigma is going to be a pretty small number, like 0 0.001, something like that. So usually these are not terribly important. And let's see, usually alpha 2 is pretty close to 1. So log of 1 is 0. So this is something close to 0. So it's not terribly important. Then I have this term associated with the mismatch of the saturation currents. Now, if I assume that IS1 equals IS2, then this whole term goes away. So we could say that V out is just VN minus V1. Now, you're probably used to seeing V1 being something like 0.65 or 0.7. If you use a resistor in the place of Q1, and that's something you get if you choose that resistor, so you get a current that gives you that approximate voltage drop. But there's nothing magical about it. We could set V1 to whatever we want here within some reasonable limits. So the main thing that I want to point out is that other than this little trick I did to deal with the early effect, this did not involve any kind of linearizations. I didn't pull out any small signal models. I didn't take any derivatives. This is just true throughout the range in which Q1 remains in the active region. We should actually talk about that a little bit. So let's scroll back up here. Okay, so my derivation assumed that the transistors were in the active region and not in what for BJTs is called saturation, but what I prefer to call the ohmic region. So when is Q1 in the active region? So for it to be in the active region, we need its collector voltage to be higher than the base voltage. So I need V out to be bigger than V1. So under the various assumptions we made down here, we wound up saying that V out is equal to V in minus V1. So I'll say this is all bigger than V1. So we really need V in to stay in the region where it's bigger than twice whatever V1 is. Notice this V1 that sets the bias current here. That is the current that the circuit's fixed at. So you need to think about that differently than a bias current where there's a small signal variation around that, like if you have a resistor down here. Now, if you can't make all of these various approximations, you can take V out and substitute all of this junk in and get some other more complicated formula, but this is the main insight. If you recall, the IS1 and IS2 here, these are quantities that vary a great deal with temperature. But if you have these transistors on the same die, or I don't know, maybe you grabbed a couple of transistors, matched them, and then you put some heat sink compound between them, as long as they're thermally coupled, the thermal variation will happen similarly for each, and that thermal variation winds up canceling out, which is a really beautiful thing.
Notice we derived all of this by starting with the Ebers mole equation, which is basically a voltage controlled current source way of viewing the BJT. You will often hear people say that MOSFETs are voltage controlled devices and BJTs are current controlled devices. As we know, it's really much better to think about these as voltage controlled devices. Now, technically, whether it's a current controlled voltage source or a voltage controlled voltage source, these are just different viewpoints. The only sources in the circuit, true physical sources, are the power supply and the voltage at the input. What the BJTs are doing is they're providing constraints. So you might better think of it as a voltage controlled current constraint or a current controlled current constraint or something like that. But once you think about constraints, you just have these equations relating the current flowing through the terminals and the voltage differences between the different terminals. It's just a matter of viewpoint. Here it's just much easier to think about it as a voltage controlled device because we are driving it with voltages. Notice I never once looked at what the base current was. Yeah, there's an alpha that shows up, but it kind of comes in through the back door. It's just an admission that some of this emitter current flows through the base as basically leakage. It's kind of a parasitic effect. Now, if you want to know what the current through the base is to say compute input impedances, yeah, you can then compute the collector currents and divide by betas and whatever if you need it, but we didn't have to do it. And if you are really insistent on pushing that current controlled current source viewpoint, then make a YouTube video and explain this circuit with all of the various aspects of it like I just did from that current controlled viewpoint and show me where it's easier and clearer than thinking about it as a voltage controlled device. You can do it, but it's kind of working in a very backwards way. If you would like to see this derivation again, but in more detail, check out this lecture titled Emitter Follower with Current Source Bias VTC Idealized Analysis and a follow-up lecture titled Effects of Finite Beta and Early Voltage from the ENGR 2420 Introduction to Microelectronic Circuits Lecture Series by Brad Minch of the Olin College of Engineering. Before H Bomber Guy comes and yells at me, this is where I got the idea for this video. I just wanted to go through the derivation myself to make sure I understand it.